Welcome to InfoWars Nightly News on this April 12, 2012 edition with me, your host, Paul Joseph Watson. Tonight on InfoWars Nightly News, is the Bilderberg Group choosing Romney's running mate? We examine the blatant political manipulation of the power elite. Then Homeland Security expands its power grab with environmental justice units. Plus, citizens in Indiana may now use deadly force to defend themselves against the growing police state. All this and more tonight. We take you now to London, England, and Paul Joseph Watson. Top story tonight. Washington Post suggests Bilderberg Group to pick Mitt Romney's running mate. A story in today's Washington Post written by veteran columnist Al Kamen suggests that the Bilderberg Group may have a decisive role to play in picking Mitt Romney's running mate, continuing a recent trend in which the secretive cabal has had a hand uh, in influencing the U.S. presidential election. So we have a 30-year veteran at the Washington Post, this Al Kamen, who has a column called In the Loop. And if anyone was in the loop, then you would expect him to be um, you know, on the inside of, of the affairs, especially given the fact that Washington Post has a Bilderberg representative at every meeting. And he basically says that just as Bilderberg picked John Edwards as Kerry's running mate in 2004, uh, after Edwards had given a strong speech on foreign policy, um, he suggests, he implies that the same process could be happening with Mitt Romney's VP pick. Um, that's what you get from reading between the lines because uh, we've got Obama and Hillary Clinton uh, jetting over to the summit of the Americas in Colombia this weekend, uh, and Senator Marco Rubio will be joining them, and he's been touted by many as a potential running mate for Mitt Romney. Of course, in 2008, we had the story of um, Obama and Clinton scuttling off to a secret meeting in Northern Virginia, by no coincidence, the same location at which that year's Bilderberg meeting was taking place. Um, and those two, as I said, are on their travels again this week. So the location and date of the Bilderberg 2012 meeting remains unknown. Um, but given that it's a U.S. presidential election year, uh, and given the role that Bilderberg routinely has in its king-making capacity, uh, the speculation that this year's confab will again take place in North America uh, is probably not far off the mark. But that in-the-loop column by Al, Kramans, Al Kamen certainly suggests that Rubio is on the list as a potential VP pick for Romney. And let's not forget that it was... Um, the former Fannie Mae CEO, um, who Obama directly asked to pick his running mate back in 2008, and that was Jim Johnson. He was also involved in the 2004 Edwards pick. So Bilderberg seems to be getting all their ducks in a line to have another influence on this year's presidential election. So whether it's Marco Rubio or not, they will certainly have a hand in deciding who Mitt Romney's running mate is this year. Moving on, Green Police, DHS, launches environmental justice units. Audi's 2010 Green Police spoof commercial may be not far off becoming reality with the announcement that the Department of Homeland Security is creating new, quote, environmental justice units that will be empowered to oversee regulations in, conjun in conjunction with local government. So the DHS is dedicating some of its agents to, quote, environmental justice, according to this um, story. Uh, this is an agency, of course, that was created in the aftermath of 9-11 to fight terrorism, in between, of course, protecting Americans from the deadly threat posed by Kinder Surprise chocolate eggs and faulty hairdryers. Now, the DHS is concerning itself with, quote, climate change and, quote, melting Arctic ice. That's part of the commitment to environmental justice that the Department of Homeland Security has engaged itself in. So how long before the green police are running checkpoints on your street with environmental TSA agents performing strip searches of your garbage can? Maybe that's the uh, direction it's heading with this new DHS focus on environmental justice. And staying on the subject of supposed 
melting Arctic ice, which, which the DHS now tells us they're very concerned about. We've got this story out of the register, which is amount of ice in Bering Sea reaches all-time record. Man, bear, pig not living up to its name once again. Quote, the amount of floating ice in the Arctic's Bering Sea, which had long been expected to retreat disastrously by climate Cassandra organizations such as Greenpeace, reached all-time record high levels last month, according to U.S. researchers monitoring the area using satellites. And this is what the global warming alarmists that Greenpeace said would happen to the Bering Sea uh, back in 1999. Quote, the first regions to be affected will be ice-dependent seas near but outside the Arctic Ocean proper, including the Bering Sea. These areas are currently covered in seasonal winter ice, which could vanish altogether with continued warming. So... 1999, the global warming alarmists come out and say this, this ice is going to vanish altogether, going to be gone, just like we heard the you know, ice-free Arctic summer propaganda a few years ago. Actually turns out that the sea is at record high levels. Again, the global warming alarmists data models proven completely inaccurate. So even as all this Agenda 21 regulation is foisted upon us by the elite with you know, pensioners being kicked out of doctors' surgeries because they live a mile away, and that's a sin against the planet because of their carbon footprint. Um, you know, even as detached homes in California are being made virtually illegal with these new zoning laws, um, the carbon tax grid is being put in still under the justification of global warming, even though back here in reality, the data refuses to conform with the climate change hysteria. Next story, it's trendy to have cancer. Barbie to roll out cancer doll with bald head chemo side effects. Reports Jonathan Benson out of Natural News. A Facebook petition signed by more than 157,000 people has prompted the Mattel company to create a new Barbie doll in the likeness of a cancer victim. It's all very trendy. According to news.com.au, the bald-headed doll, which will be dubbed a friend of Barbie is set to be released in 2013 and will come with an assortment of head dressings and clothing commonly worn by real life female cancer victims. So instead of making um, cancer victims into some kind of cultural motif, which is what this is, it's embracing a normalizing uh, skyrocketing, skyrocketing cancer rates, making it fashionable especially amongst children, um, why don't we actually spend our time looking at why cancer has gone through the roof? Why in the West now we've got more than one in three? The figure is now up to 42% in Britain of people over the course of their lifetimes will get cancer. I mean, we're climbing towards a 50% rate where half of people get cancer at some point in their lives. And as we've covered before, it's a cocktail of things. It's the bisphenol A, it's the pesticides, it's the pasteurized milk, environmental toxins. Um, and the, the fact that children are getting it at record levels also proves that it's not due to, you know, obesity and sedentary lifestyles. It's in our environment, it's in our food, it's in the things we drink, it's in the air that we breathe. And so Barbie, Mattel, the Mattel company have come out and tried to symbolize all this with a children's toy, um, tried to normalize it, tried to embrace it as a trendy, fashionable thing to do. So when, you know, 13-year-old girls are getting cancer, people will just say, oh, well, that's just the way it is now. They won't even ask the question why this is happening. And so, I mean, we've got to ask the question, why in 2012, when we're supposed to be at the pinnacle of our medical expertise as a society, um, you know, the most advanced we've, we've ever been at preventing and treating disease. Why is cancer exploding? And why now through these big toy manufacturers uh, and culture in general is cancer, especially amongst uh, young people, being normalized? Why is it being embraced? Next story. Addicting info reports. Indiana governor signs bill into law allowing citizens to use, quote, deadly force against police officers. 
Republican Governor Mitch Daniels has signed Senate Enrolled Act 1 into law in Indiana. The new law allows citizens to use deadly force against police officers they think are illegally entering their homes. Earlier this month, Addicting Info reported that the bill had passed the Senate. Republicans say the bill is designed to keep police safe, but Democrats say the bill will lead to the wanton killing of police officers. Representative Craig Fry, a Democrat, says the bill is, quote, going to cause people to die, and it's too late after somebody dies for a jury to sort it out. Um, has uh, rings of the Trayvon Martin rhetoric, where people are saying, you know, why does uh, Zimmerman deserve a trial when Trayvon never got a trial? Let's just dispense with justice altogether, and there are actually quotes just to outright murder Zimmerman. Uh, that's basically the same kind of rhetoric we're hearing with this Indiana law. We got Fry, this Democrat, repeatedly saying, people are going to die, people are going to die. But what this actually does is reverse a, a, a Supreme Court decision in Indiana last year, which stated that uh, people do not have the right to defend themselves in their own home when police unlawfully enter. Uh, we reported that on InfoWars last year. And the quote from that case was, we hold that the right to reasonably resist an unlawful police entry into a home is no longer recognized under Indiana law. And that was the case Richard L. Barnes versus Indiana. So now we've got a reversal of that. And this article by Stephen D. Foster Jr. basically uses the uh, Trayvon Martin incident, which nobody knows anything about the trial hasn't taken place yet none of the details have been substantiated they use that to claim that this is a bad law um, and that the police should have the right to just bust into your home without a warrant and do anything they like and this is the quote from this idiotic article written by stephen d foster uh, on this addicting info website which is big on pushing the whole uh, trayvon zimmerman race war angle quote as the state Supreme Court said, sometimes police officers have to enter homes to prevent the destruction of evidence or to prevent someone from grabbing a weapon in their home to use against police or someone else. Right, because that's always why police raid houses, isn't it? I mean, there's never cases of the police targeting the wrong address for a drug raid and it ends up with guns being pointed at some granny who's sitting there. I mean, this argument presumes that every unlawful raid without a warrant is justified. When it's not, it's the complete opposite in 100% of cases. So I'm sorry, Mr. Stephen Foster of Addicting Info, but if you check your constitution, you'll find a line about uh, Americans having the right to remain, quote, secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. That's right. It's called the Fourth Amendment. Try looking it up. Next story. How the elites manipulate big stocks and why they're failing out the Daily Bell. Where has all the trading gone? It's one of the biggest mysteries on Wall Street. How can stocks be in their fourth year of a bull market and trading activity be so low? And this is the dominant social theme being put out. What's wrong with the stock market? It's just in the doldrums and will recover shortly. In fact, it already did. Free market analysis. This kind of question is a kind of elite dominant social theme, no doubt about it. It frames the conversation and presupposes that the market itself is a greater good and that its growing failure is bound to be mitigated by additional success. So again, more elitist memes about the so-called economic recovery. Meanwhile, the jobless figures are out today. They're going up again, highest rate since January. That was supposed to have turned around by now, according to the Obama administration. It hasn't. Um, we've got people like Mark Farber, Jim Rogers, coming out and saying the big crash is still around the corner. And those are the people who predicted the meltdown in the first place while all the happy clappers in the media were busy telling people to take out subprime mortgages and use their homes as a license to print money in 2006 uh, and 2007 before the Lehman Brothers collapsed in 2008. So I'm going to stick to what they say. I'm not going to believe the elitist meme that the stock market is recovering, the economy re is recovering, even as trading in the stock market is at an all-time low. And for tonight's quote of the day, we turn to Steve Irwin, crocodile hunter. 
quote, I believe sustainable use is the greatest propaganda in wildlife conservation at the moment. That's Steve Irwin, crocodile hunter, who was actually a part of the whole UN sustainable development team throughout much of his um, career before his tragic death. Uh, from that quote, it seems that towards the end of it, Irwin was becoming familiar with the realization that Agenda 21 and sustainable development was a giant scam, just as many others within the global warming, green wildlife conservation movement have done the same. Towards the end of it, they actually realize that it's a big scam. These elitists do not care about the environment. They do not care about wildlife. They care about acquiring and centralizing power. So that's the quote of the day from Steve Irwin. We're going to take a break now on M4Wars Nightly News. Uh, once again, we encourage all of you to subscribe at prisonplanet.tv. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, you can watch the show live. You can get access to Alex Jones' radio show archives, speeches, interviews, special events, a whole plethora of media, uh, and it supports this operation. It allows us to continue to do this, uh, to reach out on this information platform. So please subscribe at prisonplanet.tv. Coming up after the break, we're going to talk to InfoWars reporter Darren McBreen on the latest situation in Roswell uh, about the tragic case of Andrew Wordy's terrorized to death by government harassment and abuse. Uh, so we're going to go to that interview and we're also going to go to a special uh, info package on the United Nations Agenda 21. Stay with us. Welcome to InfoWars, I'm Kyle Phillips. Today we're talking about the growing police state and really what that means. Um, a lot of people in the United States really don't even notice that the police state is happening and if they do, they, they really don't care. Like People just don't see it, they just go along their, their normal days. You know, people, I was just in the city recently to film and a lot of people, you know, you see the tourists walking around and they're looking at the skyline and all the beautiful buildings. Wow, look at how big they are. But what they don't notice is the camera right underneath of it, right in their line of view. They just, they just breeze right past that. The average person, even if they do know about what's going on, specifically with Big Brother watching you uh, via cameras everywhere, uh, a lot of people don't even care. Uh, as, as a 9-11 victim, I feel like a lot of, of uh, my subscribers and people on InfoWars want to hear us talk about 9-11. And so I would like to ask you, what is your opinion on 9-11? What is your opinion on 9-11? <laughs> well, there's three uh, things to consider on 9-11. One, was there inside information before the event? Two, did the people with that inside information participate in the event? And three, were they doing so on behalf of some foreign interest or governmental interest. On the first one, the answer is unequivocally yes. Mm -hmm. People had inside information before the event. We see this telegraphed to us in the options market and the players involved. Buzzy Krongard, who was at Alex Brown, who then went to work with George Tennant, the CIA, the direct pipeline between the CIA and Alex Brown, where we know that $5 million of profits from airline foot trading was never collected. Mm -hmm. My theory is that it was a Morgan Stanley broker in the South Tower who died in the event, who could have lived had he escaped, but decided oh to my. stay and trade those options. That's very interesting. And, and died. And we're, we're working on a, a film about that called Broker Zero. Oh, wow. I, that's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, now, the other two scenarios, did the people who were trading on this information, were they helping to organize and plan the, uh, the information, the, the event? I, I don't see any evidence to suggest that. I, I have no proof to, to, to say that that's, that's so. Similarly, I have no evidence to suggest that they were any connection to a foreign government that was working in cahoots with these guys to mm -hmm. do it. I don't have any, any proof of that, uh, of those, of those parts of the story, but I do know unequivocally I can stay with assurance because I talked to actually people in the, the, the uh, twin towers because Anna Fitzgerald who lost 600 people that day, they had purchased my company just months before the event. Hmm. So I was in touch with those people. And I had also worked at Alex Brown as a stockbroker. In the late 80s, early in the late, uh, yeah, late 80s. And I knew Brosie Kroenger. I met him a few times. Oh. So I, I'm actually, I, I know all the three sides of the triangle I see, I see. here. I know Alex Brown. I knew Kenneth Fitzgerald. 
I knew the buzz on these airline puts because the conversation at that time was, this is like the Morton Thai call situation before the Space Shutter Challenger blew up. Mm -hmm. You know, when the Space Shutter Chal Challenger blew up, the uh, the options on Morton Thai call, which was the solid fuel booster rocket company, were there was about a 10 second lag time where you could have bought those puts and made a killing. And I was one of these people. I was working at Oppenheimer at the time. And I was talking to people about these options trading as if something had blown up mm -hmm. and there people are like, yeah, but nothing has blown up. What's, and then they're rumored. Well, there's, right. there's a rumor that something is going to blow up. And then you trace oh, that rumor and you say, Oh, well, it's coming out of Alex Brown, my wow. employer. So I'm like, Hey, have you heard this rumor? Like, yeah, there's a rumor. Wow. Something's about to blow up. And then you hear Buzzy Krongard's name. Where is Buzzy? Oh, he's over at the CIA now. Right. Oh, okay. Well, um, you know, where are, the, where are these located, these rumors? In New York. Then you talk to the people at Canter Fitzgerald, who I just bought my company, huh? right. Hollywood Stock Exchange. And they're like, well, you know, of course, uh, rumors are floating around, et cetera. And I was in Italy at the time. And uh, the day after 9-11, I was actually in the Vatican Square, and I heard the Pope give a, uh, a prayer meeting. Uh, very rarely, he also did a piece of it in uh, English. <laughs> and uh, his, his comments were so benign and so anodyne and so useless that I actually got up and left in the middle. I remember people were like, who's this guy leaving in the middle of the Pope's speech? But uh, he couldn't outright heckle the Pope as <laughs> such with all those Swiss guards around. Right. But I did protest by just walking out on him. I felt that his... The first order of business is we have an article that comes from Fox News that was actually related back on the Infowars.com. Exclusive. Anwar al-Awlaki, leader of Al-Qaeda, number two, dying at the Pentagon just months before 9-11. Now, am I the only one that finds this very suspicious? That after 9-11, so-called Al-Qaeda, the actual people who were said to be responsible for September 11th, their number two leader had dinner with Pentagon brass. Exclusive article from Fox News, Fox News, and yet no one seems to care. Does this goes to show that our military leaders are actually intertwined with these individuals? Like I said before, going back to the late 1970s into the 1980s, we see that the US CIA actually created Al Qaeda to fight against the Soviet Union when they invaded Afghanistan. If I asked you if you could be considered a suspected terrorist, many of you would probably laugh. But that's exactly what the FBI's terrorism watch list keeps track of every day, suspected terrorists. And that watch list is well over one million names and counting. The FBI Terrorist Screening Center has put out a list of suspicious activities reporting guidelines entitled Communities Against Terrorism. These guidelines were given out to everywhere from beauty supply stores to electronic shops to airports and bus stations, instructing the workers there on how to look for a suspected terrorist by their behavior and who to report that to. Now, I think some of the behaviors on these lists would really surprise you. I decided to talk to a few people just to see if by the FBI TSC standards, they could be considered suspected terrorists. Have you ever paid for a large purchase with cash? Uh, grocery shopping, yeah. Have you ever mumbled to yourself in public? Uh, often when I'm looking for directions. Have you ever paid for a large purchase with cash? Yes, I have. Have you ever bought coffee and paid with cash? Yeah. Have you ever accidentally gone out in public overdressed for the weather? Um, I think I am right now. Have you ever sweated at an airport? Well, yes. Have you ever been given a ride to the store and been dropped off and picked up later? Yes. Have you ever taken extra luggage on a trip? Who hasn't? Protesters came to local Congressman Tim Bishop's town hall meeting to protest his big government deficit spending record in Washington. We spoke with some of the protesters. Let's hear what they had to say. We're here today to put the pressure on our representative, Tim Bishop. This week alone, we're voting on cap and trade legislation. That's nothing more than an energy tax. We're talking about the cost of gasoline going up to $7 a gallon, $7 a gallon for home heating oil. We're talking about a 300% increase in the cost of electricity and natural gas. 
The middle class in this country cannot afford that kind of an increase. They say that they're doing it for the environment, but there is no necessarily uh, a, a connection between what the money is going to be spent for and the environment. We're talking about the biggest tax in the history of the United States of America in the name of the environment, and that one dollar will go to the environment. It's going to increase the cost of energy. It was more than just a cloudy day. When we went inside, this is what one Long Islander had to say. Is it constitutional that the government owns a car company? No. Is this no. It seemed like Bishop was more interested in getting out of the meeting than answering real questions. We caught up with Bishop after the meeting and had a couple of questions of our own concerning the environment and carbon taxes. We have to do something. Whether cap and trade is the answer or a carbon tax is the answer, we have to do something to reduce our carbon footprint. And I'm going to support anything, not anything, I'm going to support a bill that reduces our carbon footprint and gives us an opportunity to have an energy future that is clean and independent of foreign oil. That's my position. There's a good logic to that, but do you also understand that global warming the last 12 years, the temperature has reduced on this planet? What? There's scientific proof for that. The last 12 years, the temperature has decreased on the planet. If you're, if you're going to try to convince me that global warming is not real, I'm not interested. I'm announcing our biggest contest ever. And we're looking for people who love freedom and who want to be all in in the resistance to tyrants. So you say you want to fight the new world order. Why, if you were on the radio, if you were Alex Jones, you'd really kick some globalist ass. Well, here's your chance. We're hiring not one, but two new reporters whose reports are going to be on the radio, whose reports are going to be on the nightly news, who will even anchor the show. If you're ready, here's your chance to step into my shoes and I hope you surpass what I've done. Two winners, $10,000 in prizes, and a shot to be a reporter inside the InfoWars.com command center. We're looking to hire one male reporter and one female reporter. And when you win, you win $5,000. Your video gets seen by hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people on YouTube, and you get put into the very front of the running to be hired as a reporter slash anchor right here in our operation. Do you have what it takes to be the next Info Warrior? The rules are posted below me here and at InfoWars.com. This is a big deal. You know, the globalists are expanding their global empire, but at the same time, the people are waking up all over the world. We've expanded our operations in the last year. We've added the nightly news five nights a week. We're making more special reports. We're reaching 15 million people every week. In a year, I want that to be 30 million. This is your chance to join the team. I want to see what you can do. But a big hint is this. Can your news piece make the news? Does it get people's attention? Does it educate people? Does it open minds? That's more important than being beautiful or speaking with perfect eloquence as an orator. All of that is important, but we're looking for people that have that magic spark, that fire of liberty in their heart, because I want you to join our team. I want to give you a launch pad so you can really take off and engage the globalist. And if this works, We'll have contests all the time, and we'll continue to build this operation. I'm involved in a talent search, looking for people who have the fires of liberty burning in their hearts and their minds. You've got until April 30th to complete your news report, and then we'll announce the winners one week later. Are you going to join the info war? Do you have what it takes? It's up to you. All serious entries will be posted on InfoWars.com. So everybody wins. You're getting the message of liberty out. 
And that's what really matters. But in the final equation, it's not about showing Alex Jones what you got. It's about showing the world and the globalist that no army can stop an idea whose time has come. Join me in the Info War. So you say you want to fight the Info War. You say you want to go head up against the New World Order. You can do a better job than Alex Jones. I know you can. And here's your chance to prove your mettle. enjoy it when the globalists try to poison us and uh, well we resist them via a free market system hello my fellow info warriors alex jones here introducing you to the pro pure family of gravity fed filters now you know that the globalists are filling our water with radioactive isotopes fluoride lead mercury arsenic and one of the few systems that can efficiently and economically remove or reduce down to non-detectable levels these poisons are gravity-fed filters and ProPure is the top of the line their filters are impregnated with silver a natural antibiotic on top of that they're bigger so they filter faster you don't have to prime these the first time you use them it's amazing. Go to InfoWars.com and click on the shopping cart link uh, to see the entire family of these babies. Now, the fluoride they add to our water is so tiny that most filters can't cut it out. But ProPure has their system that will, again, reduce it to non-detectable levels, almost get all of it out of there that's also available and if you look at the different systems they offer the pro pure big brush finish is on a stand so it's easier on a table or at your restaurant or wherever you have it to go up with a glass or a mug and fill it up then there's this big baby right here the pro pure king large version got a lot of different options that come with it also they have the pro pure big probably one of the best values out there and of course it's burnished stainless steel and then what i use on my RV, something that's great for your hunting cabin or the back porch is the Pro Pure Traveler. Small and portable, but packs a huge punch, cleans out all that garbage. They also have a glass sight spigot, so you don't have to take the top off and look in the bottom area to see how much water. You can see how fast it's filtering with this optional uh, system. The globalists obviously are hitting us through our water. It's time to take control of our lives. It's time to not give our children and families these poisons. And these systems cut it down to non-detectable levels across the board. ProPure is the name. I only promote what I believe in. And I use ProPure in my home and my office. And I recommend that you check out the information on ProPure at InfoWars.com. We already have the lowest price at InfoWars.com on the ProPure Gravity Filter System. But when you add in the 10% off when InfoWarriors use the product code WATER at InfoWars.com, nobody can top it. So again, it's a win-win-win. Stop drinking the poison water. Uh, checkmate the globalist when it comes to your health and support InfoWars.com and the work we're doing here. You know, many revolutionaries rob banks and things and kidnap people for funds. We promote in the free market the products we use that are about preparedness. That's how we fund this revolution against the New World Order in our move to restore our constitutional republic and a spirit of 1776 worldwide. Check it out at InfoWars.com. Pro Pure, top of the line, number one, most powerful and effective and economical gravity fed water system in the world. Pro Pure, available, discounted at InfoWars.com. Don't forget product code WATER to save 10%. It's the latest generation, years in development. Pro Pure is the name. Okay, now we're going to cross to Roswell, Georgia, to talk about the story of uh, Andrew Wordy's terrorized to death, quite literally, by government harassment and abuse. Of course, most of you probably know the story by now. A man who just wanted to raise chickens on his own land 
uh, intimidated, hunted down by local bureaucrats to the point where his land was declared a green zone uh, and the property was raided. And, of course, the tragic conclusion was uh, an explosion in the house and Wordies was later found dead. And we're joined now by... InfoWars reporter Darren McBreen on the ground there in Roswell, Georgia. Uh, Darren, just tell us who you've been talking to today. I believe you were escorted out of City Hall by the police simply for trying to get some answers. Well, just before we get started, uh, just to make sure there's no mix-up, I want to prove to you, see that? that? That is my press pass. So I guess that is my legal documentation. I am now legit. Um, now we went to, I'm actually making fun of the Fulton Police Department. We tried to go to City Hall and we were rejected immediately. As soon as we pulled up, attempted to walk in, we were met by the police department who said we didn't have the proper credentials to enter City Hall. And um, uh, before long, there was uh, three police cars. They demanded uh, that our, our credentials and uh, we were told that we could not go in. Even though you've got the press pass, you're there to ask some legitimate questions, and they just—it's par for the course with the treatment that, that they've gave to this case at every point. Um, have you had a chance to talk to any of the uh, neighbours and the residents down there to get a sentiment of what they feel about uh, the tragic events that occurred at the end of last month? You know, it's it's interesting that you ask that. We did talk to a few neighbours. Everybody seems very sympathetic uh, to you know Andrew. Um, they all feel horrible, and the place is, uh, you know, it's, there's a lot of traffic. Every car that goes by slows down. It's kind of a somber, quiet, you know, place right now. I, I still think that the community, you know, the shock is still here, you know, and um, everybody's very saddened by what happened. And uh, did you have a chance to actually visit the, the house? Yeah, we knocked on a few doors. Uh, we talked to a few neighbors. Uh, we're going to have a report on Monday, uh, put that footage together. So we did manage to talk to some of them. And, uh, you know, he was very popular in the area. He, uh, you know, nobody had a problem with his chickens. Um, he was called the chicken man and, and, you know, lovingly so. They weren't making fun of him. He, he had, you know, his share of chickens. He raised them since he was 10 years old. He uh, provided the neighbors with eggs, and I guess that's evil, so I don't know. Uh, the neighbors loved him, they miss him, and uh, they're very saddened by what happened. Well, that, that's a pretty big thing because, of course, we know one of the excuses these bureaucrats tried to uh, deploy was the claim that his chicken farm was a nuisance, a nuisance to his neighbors, and if you've talked to them and they've said the opposite, uh, then that's just another, another thing to disprove their claim against him. Um, Another thing well, that I saw, yeah, go ahead. That's simply, well, I was going to say that's simply not the case, uh, at least to the neighbors we talked to in the immediate surrounding areas. Um, they, you know, they had no problem. They were all good friends. And like I said, he provided eggs. Do you know that he even took eggs on a regular basis to the local elementary school? He taught the children about, you know, nature and, and, and the chickens. And, you know, and he liked these roosters, like the, the neighbors were saying, as like some people have pet dogs, the roosters... And the chickens, you know, he actually loved these animals. So he definitely was not, uh, you know, uh, treating them bad or abusing them in any way. And uh, he was up to all the codes. And, uh, you know, the guy ran a smooth operation. He was just simply harassed. And we were talking to you before the interview. There's actually an article uh, entitled, Sheriff, Wordy's Incident Could Have Been Avoided. And this is Fulton County Sheriff Ted Jackson who said, quote, this was ugly, it shouldn't have happened, and it didn't have to happen. And his office, the sheriff's office, actually refused to take part in the raid that led to uh, Wordy's death. And also the Roswell police refused to have any part of it. Well, it, this was the actual federal marshals. They were the only ones that would actually take on the job of raiding the house. Everybody else refused to do so. Isn't that interesting? That is interesting, and I just heard bits and pieces of that myself. I would, uh, I'm going to try to talk with, uh, with Mr. Jackson, you said. Uh, tomorrow we're definitely going to try to talk to him. But, yeah, it's looking more and more like a federal land grab. And, um, you know, it's, you know, the Fulton Police Department, I, I did hear that, that there were several police officers that did not want to participate, so the county sheriffs had to go at it alone. Yeah, I mean, this is the, the article makes it clear that there was a, a definite disagreement between the uh, sheriffs, the police, and the feds there. 
Um, and they're actually critical of the feds in this article. So uh, that would be an excellent interview to get. Um, yeah, well, go ahead. Just wondering, I mean, what's your sense? Are we actually going to see any legal retribution against some of these councillors whose uh, behaviour, I, I saw the interview that Rob Dew did with uh, Mike Adams the other day, he described it as a, a deliberate conspiracy to destroy Mr Wordy's life. Uh, is there any cause for legal retribution against these councillors who so blatantly harassed him into uh, apparently taking his own life? I would imagine there is going to be lawsuits, but you know, I'm only guessing. Um, I do know this, that the city council is not interested in, in speaking with us. You know, obviously they had police come out immediately. Um, another interesting thing is when we left city hall, and we went back to Andrew's property, you know, the police showed up uh, immediately again, you know, and so, and also when we we're at city hall the first time, they knew that we were at the property because one of the police officers even mentioned, he said, you guys were at the chicken man's property today, weren't you? So the Fulton police, you know, they're cooperating in some way uh, with the city council. Um, you know, they wouldn't allow us on the, on the city hall grounds, for example, but uh, I would imagine, you know, I wouldn't be surprised one bit if there's lawsuits that, uh, that are about to happen soon. So we still have questions circulating about the exact circumstances of Mr. Wordy's death, and I believe you've actually got some uh, quite interesting photographs uh, which contradict the notion that the explosion that killed him occurred inside the house. Well, yeah, I mean, we found a, uh, a burn-up gas can. I think we took some pictures today, sent them to you guys. Um, there, was, there was a gas can. The, the place... <laughs> It was, it was, you know, you could tell that something, an explosion, uh, windows were blown out, but it was, it looks worse on the inside, let me tell you something, than it does on the outside. It, the whole place is burnt out on the inside. You could still smell the burnt wood, and, um, you know, you could tell it was recent that it happened, but they also have a police line around some of the area and no trespassing signs everywhere as well. So what's, uh, what's on the agenda before you wrap up? Who else do you plan to talk to? Well, we would uh, like to talk to some more of the neighbors. Uh, we may be able to speak with um, uh, Andrew Wordis, his attorney, and, and we're going to try to go into City Hall and see why that the average American citizen, much less you know, journalist, is unable to walk through City Hall and simply ask questions. Uh, we're going to find that out tomorrow for sure. Okay, Darren McBreen, uh, we'll, hear, we'll be hearing from you on the Alex Jones Show tomorrow. Thank you for joining us. All right, thank you, Paul. Take care. So, Agenda 21, eco-fascism bears its teeth again in the case of Andrew Wordy's harassed, abused, intimidated into uh, giving up his land. He refused to do so, uh, and the feds eventually raided uh, and led to his tragic death, as we just heard. Uh, the timeline on Natural News um, runs through it. It actually started in 2008, this case. Uh, a litany of legal threats and intimidation by the state, by the city councillors in Roswell, Georgia, um, declaring Word's property to be a nuisance, even though, as you just heard, Darren McBreen talked to all the neighbours. They all loved him, gave them eggs, took eggs to the local elementary school. The neighbours liked him. They said he wasn't a nuisance. That was their claim in trying to seize his property. Then we had them um, refuse to allow him to uh, defend his property against floods. It, it flooded on more than one occasion. Uh, when Wordies was in jail for mistakenly uh, missing a report for his probation, they actually advertised the fact that his house was vacant, openly advertising it to criminals who then went and stole his firearms, stole his expensive equipment, uh, just a con constant campaign of harassment and abuse. Um, and then they actually designated his land as a, quote, green zone, uh, so they could steal it under this sustainable development uh, UN Agenda 21 mandate. And, of course, it all culminated in what we've just discussed, which was uh, word is when the, the feds went to raid his property, the, the sheriff's office refused, the police refused, said it wasn't necessary, the show of force wasn't necessary. And then he, he actually blew himself up, blew his own house up. That was the tragic conclusion. And this all took us by surprise. I mean, this was all over uh, before the end of March. We only heard about it this week after it had all ended. 
Um, so it just it proves again how these things are happening around the country and the likes of Infowars and Natural News, two of the biggest organizations that would normally cover this kind of story. We weren't even aware of it until after it was all over. So if it's happening when we're not aware of it, you know, it's, it's going to be happening in different cases. And it's all part of Agenda 21. You know, detached homes me being made virtually illegal in California under these similar zoning laws. Uh, humans being crammed into high-density prison cities, uh, as the climate change alarmists have called for recently. And again, simple chicken farmers being hunted down because their gov the government designates their land to be an environmental green zone. So this is eco-fascism bearing its teeth. Uh, and in this special report that we're going to go to, we're going to lift the lid on the truth behind this sustainable development scam and the UN's Agenda 21. So that's going to do it for today's InfoWars Nightly News. Uh, I've been your host, Paul Joseph Watson, and now we're going to lift the lid on the UN's Agenda 21. The city of Austin, Texas, has installed motion-detecting surveillance cameras along the property lines of people's backyards in western Travis County. There ought to be a way, eventually, where those cameras can be <clears throat> oriented uh, in a, a, away from the homes if they want to watch for any movement or any trespass out there. I, they have a right to do that. And if the surveillance cameras weren't intrusive enough, the city has also installed these prison-style fences along the property lines. They put this prison fence up and have cameras pointed at you? And only you. In fact, one home, just a couple down, cleared all the cedar trees, planted grass, and mows the area, trespassing regularly yeah. out there to keep that area mowed. It doesn't make it, and, and yet they didn't put a fence up there. And put a camera in. These unfortunate residents are neighbors to an encroaching vacuum of government land grabbing, all tied to the precautionary principle of the UN's Agenda 21. I was the county judge of Travis County when the Balcones Candy Lands uh, Conservation Plan and the permit under the Endangered Species Act was applied for. Uh, this wasn't long after I took office in 1987. It was announced that the territory uh, uh, and nesting areas for the golden cheek warbler and the black cap vireo covered a huge area of western Travis County. And in essence, what the, uh, the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife said was that to enforce the Endangered Species Act, th there could be no tree clearing, there could be no development activity. Um, and uh, anything that might cause noise during the uh, breeding season, nesting season, it shut down any development in the western part of the county. A lot of public money, millions of dollars of public money that went into buying the preserves area um, from the landowners. The Nature Conservancy and others got private money in there and helped leverage uh, purchases. Some property owners just sold conservation rights they were able to stay there. They don't develop it, but they, but they got paid to conserve their area. If they don't do a good job of managing the preserves and protecting them from fire, every bit of the money that was invested in public and private funds for these preserve systems is wasted. I don't think our elected officials are paying much attention to this. And instead, they're re overreacting yeah. with, with this kind of bull mm -hmm. uh, hurting adjacent homeowners. Uh, for, for doing things that frankly should have been done by the government itself. They should have cleared those trees away from the neighborhoods and done a better job of managing the preserves so they help the species. So we've got the worst of both worlds going on right now. But if you're considering buying a home next door and you, you see there's cameras out there spying on the backyard and this ugly uh, uh, fence next door, you're not as interested in buying that home next door. The precautionary principle states that if an action or policy has a suspected risk of causing harm to the public or to the environment, in the absence of scientific consensus that the action or policy is harmful, the burden of proof that is not harmful falls on those taking the action. Basically, guilty before proven innocent. The European Union deems this principle an actual law.
while the United States has labeled it a precautionary approach and uses it to create policy. The genesis of Agenda 21 begins with the Brundtland Commission's Our Common Future, reported to the United Nations in 1987. This report defined the term sustainable development, stated as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of the future generations to meet their own needs. In order to define what these needs of the present are and what to implement in order to scale down daily aspects of human activity, Maurice Strong developed Agenda 21 and presented it at the Rio Earth Summit in 1992. Climate change affects the very future of life on Earth. We have to remember that life as we know it on Earth has only existed for a very small portion of the Earth's history and within very narrow parameters. And we are changing those parameters. So life is actually in danger. You'll hear Maurice Strong uh, on two occasions introduce uh, Lord Rothschild. And Lord Rothschild comes on and basically advocates for another um, United Nations fund to be set up, another special bank to deal with the environment, one of many that's already there. And Rothschild, of course, you find in the clip, this bank they want to set up, funded by our tax money as penalties against the environment, will go through Rothschild's private bank, the family bank in Switzerland, so he'll be in charge of it. Uh, this multi-multi-multi-trillionaire multi doesn't need money, but here he is handling everyone else's money uh, in the forms of penalization against the environment. What is a new paradigm? We call it sustainable development. Sustainable development. Yeah, that's really right. economic okay. development uh -huh. that is carried out in a manner that creates a positive synthesis between the economic, the social, uh, and the environmental dimensions. Of Long term. Yes. And mm -hmm. therefore, it isn't a, a goal in itself. It's mm -hmm. a pathway. Yes. It's a means uh -huh. to a sustainable, secure, and equitable future uh -huh. for humankind. Uh -huh. uh, all these conditions we're talking about yes. uh, will only be dealt with through a very, uh, for, through a process by which we try to create the policy structure that supports people in their struggle for a better life. More recently, just before the Copenhagen round of the negotiations to establish a world government treaty, a treaty draft was produced by the bureaucracy that acts as the secretariat of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which was first put into place at the Rio Earth Summit in 1992. Now, this Framework Convention on Climate Change, to which some 192 countries are now subscribers, has as its avowed intention the establishment again of a supranational body regulated by a treaty which will bind all those 192 member governments, including the United States, including the United Kingdom. And the intention is that that body will have unlimited powers of taxation, unlimited powers of regulation, not only in the environmental field, but also in the economic field generally. And the treaty draft of September the 15th last year which proposed the establishment of this world government actually contained the word government used in that global context for the first time in any seriously contemplated international treaty. And I reveal that in the 186 pages of this world government treaty, not once did the words election, democracy, ballot or vote occur in any context. The four sections of 40 chapters of Agenda 21 leave no stone unturned when it comes to absolute control of humanity. It places nature above mankind and calls for an end to national sovereignty. The abolition of private property, the restructuring of the family, and restrictions on transportation and individual opportunity. This map clearly shows the human settlement zones according to Agenda 21 planned for the near future. Red is off limits, yellow is highly regulated, and green is normal use.
President Clinton issued Executive Order Number 12852, creating the President's Council on Sustainable Development. The PCSD has eroded the foundation of U.S. public policy according to the master plan of the United Nations ever since. We are talking about a globalist plan that remakes your city to a specific model. This is not only in the United States, it's all across the United States and all across the world. And you'll see these plans. They are, um, they're called One Bay Area. They're called Four States, One Vision. They often have the, the word vision in them, or they might be your city 2050 or your city 2035. They're planning out to uh, 2050. This is the planning, you know, what we're looking at is a planning revolution here. And it's a totalitarian plan that they're implementing. I want to let people know that totalitarian plans all share every totalitarian plan, whether it was under Stalin or Hitler or Mao, they all share the same elements. And you will recognize it here in your country, wherever you live, you'll see that there's being a takeover and a total control of all land use, of your educational system, of means of production, your, all of your resources, okay? Also, you'll see it's all for the common good. It's all for the fatherland. It's all for the homeland. It's all for everyone's good, right? The individual will lose against this. Um, you see the scarcity mentality. Oh, there's not enough. You have to restrict yourself. You have to conserve. You know, am I a pig? Do I want to use everything up? No, but we're talking about uh, this is a totalitarian uh, design. Well, this is about okay. them controlling who they dole it out to. This is about right. them setting the standards of uh, your light bulb, your toilet, your parking space, your roads, destroying your roads, and they admit to shut you down to make you poor so they can control you. They all brag about it. It took a good man's life to reveal the true local Agenda 21 intentions implemented in Roswell, Georgia. City Council and City of Roswell Code Enforcement had identified Andrew Wardis' property as a conservation area or green space in 2003. In 2008, they began the bloodthirsty plan to illegally steal the land right out from underneath them and caused his premature death through unjust bullying and by violating city code ordinances. Let's roll that timeline real quick, and you could just kind of go over it. And, I mean, it's sure. really, it's a sad situation. Here's a guy well, raising chickens. A backyard really chicken farmer, a car mechanic. This began several years ago. This has been going on, for, well, from December 2008. You can see uh, there's our Friday Fright Night city code enforcer there. on the Vicky the Hunt, Markley. <laughs> oh, yeah. my goodness. Yeah. Anyway, this this goes on. There were some people in the city who tried to help him out. Others the said The mayor no. seemed to help, want to help the, him out. The mayor tried to help him. They changed the rules on him to try to criminalize his backyard chickens after the fact without allowing him to be grandfathered in. They caused his property to be flooded because they refused to maintain a culvert that then flooded his property. In Austin, Texas, the city council set their sights on a prized piece of land in South Austin. FEMA rewrote the floodplain map to include this neighborhood. The residents were quickly bought out with federal grants supplemented with bond money and their homes demolished. FEMA is rewriting floodplain maps all over the country and extorting money from property owners by making them purchase flood insurance. Well, we had an article in the paper the other day, David, that stated the fact that the National Marine Fishery Service, which is part of NOAA, that's directly linked to EPA, wants to put 500-foot buffers on all the waterways in the state of Washington for pesticide herbicide application. They're not going to take the land away. They're just not going to allow us to farm the land. And if they, they do that, 61% of our ground will be out of production in the state of Washington. Yes, and look what we got now. We have a White House Rural Council. Are you nervous about this? Sure, and anybody that's in rural America should be worried about this. Why the FCC and why so many important bigwigs from the White House? Give me a break. These people are not going to be sitting around at some conspiracy theory around a table plotting the takeover of the heartland. If you look at well, what the council it for? does. Then what's it for? Hang on, guys. What's it for then? I mean, uh, really, it, it, it's, it's overreaching. Assist. It's an overreach. I, I have a hunch that people How in the heartland are going, we're doing just fine. Thank you very much. Keep your grimy How? hands off us. The natural world in which man lives and on which we, he depends, is indeed deteriorating, is being uh, destroyed in many instances at a, uh, a rate that is accelerating and that can only continue to accelerate unless we begin to control the activities that are, are, are having this destructive impact. Now, whether we are pessimistic or optimistic depends really on what we think about the nature of man. 
whether we really believe that man, in light of this evidence, is going to be wise enough and enlightened enough to uh, subject himself to this kind of discipline and control. Darren McBreen, InfoWars Nightly News.